Some of you who uh, are not familiar with our program may be wondering why we're in uniform tonight. But we, we decided to wear our uniforms because this is the way we dress when we go to the schools to talk to the kids. When we first started out, we didn't, we didn't do that. And then uh, I think Russ or somebody else said, if we don't look, or maybe it was Ted, I think it was Ted, said, uh, if we don't uh, wear a uniform or something to identify ourselves, we look just like a bunch of old guys. <laughs> so now we're, just a, now we're a bunch of old guys with uniforms. <laughs> so this is why we decided to dress, because this is what we do. And you know something, it really does have a positive effect on the uh, audience, we think. Uh, we got started on it when Mike Godburn started dressing up and came into the classroom. And we were so impressed by how he looked that we said, hey, we can do that too. But we did. Uh, Ed and I are going to share some of our experiences. We, we're not going to give you a lot of uh, uh, all uh, grim stories. But we're going to give you just some light ones. But I want to start off by telling you that I have to agree with, uh, with what Russ said entirely. If we had been incarcerated by the Japanese, the chances are pretty good we wouldn't even be here. Uh, when we talked about having this kind of a program, Russ suggested that we include some of the Japanese prisoners of war, and I didn't want to do it because I think that they are so much different and what they went through that they should, you should listen to them separately. I don't want to mix them, because I, like, I feel like a civilian compared to these guys. 30% of all of the Japanese prisoners of war died in captivity. In Germany, about 1%. And I'll tell you the difference right there. If you were captured by the, by the Germans, you may have been bunged up pretty badly, but the well, chances it's of surviving... Well, it depends if you were captured by uh, the civilians or by the military men. That's correct. The military men were great. They never bothered, they treated us well. But the civilians, if you happen to come down in a city or a town, especially near a place that was just bombed, they treated you real bad. They kicked you around, knocked you around, did everything to you. Okay, so who captured you at... I was lucky. I got captured by the military. So did I. I was, I was coming down from my parachute and landed in an open field with the woods a little ways across. And I said, well, maybe I would hit for the woods and I might have a chance to escape. So I took my parachute off and put it down in a ditch about six foot deep, come back up and started to head towards the woods. And from over here comes one German officer. He had on a, what looks like a sweatsuit, black sweatpants and black shirt with a big white skull and crossbones in the center. And then coming from the woods was all these German soldiers with rifles. Come to find out, that's where they took us after they captured me. Come to find out it was an R&R &R camp for the German soldiers. There was a whole bunch of young girls there. Some of them were pretty nice looking to keep the boys happy, but that's what it was. And they treated us very good, actually. Guys the girls. The first, the first few minutes that you're, you're captured, I don't know what went through Ed's mind, but uh, the first thing that, that you think about is what are they going to do to you? You know, this is the moment of reality. Up until this point, it's, it's all been uh, theory, you know. They're going to treat you well, they're not going to treat you well. You don't really know. So you're just sweating it out. And my experience was, here I am, flat on my back. I couldn't move. I was banged up pretty badly, as, as you know. And uh, this German major came in to interrogate me. And I could hardly keep from laughing because 
he must have been watching too many Hollywood movies. Uh-huh. He came in with the with the with a coat draped over like like a cape instead of uh, with the with the arms through, and he was holding the cigarette like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "My God, it's right out of Central Casting." <laughs> And he says, uh, what did you, and he had a real German accent, but he uh, says, you might as well tell us, we know everything about you, where you come from and so on. You came from Foggia, you uh, were flying in a B-24, which was wrong. I was in a B-17. And, well, they uh, asked us, they thought we were, they mentioned all English bombers when, when they captured us. Yeah, so... Uh, Immediately, I felt 100% better because I said, gee, the Germans don't know everything. <laughs> they can't even tell a B-24 from a B-17. <clears throat> when I was captured after the, when they took us into the commandant's office at this R&R camp, he started asking us very politely you know, what, what kind of plane we were in. Of course, my whole crew was there, all but the two that died. And nobody knew nothing. So then he said, were you in a Halifax or were you in, you know, all English planes. They didn't even know a B-17 from a, from a, a fighter plane. So then we started asking him questions. He says, I don't know nothing either. <laughs> so there was also a sergeant in the room. He talked to him in German and he left. He came back. And he had glasses for everybody and a bottle of cognac. And he gave us all a shot of cognac, which I thought was pretty nice. We could use it about that time. So uh, after your initial interrogation, what happened then? Well, they what took us to, a, to an air base where there was Air Force personnel, and they just put us in a building. It was, I guess it was a barracks, but it was pretty well falling apart. And they just separated us and put us in rooms. And we stayed there for another day. And then we were taken to Dulag Luf, which is the interrogation camp. And that was one man per room. The room had one small table, about that square, one chair, and one palliasse laying on the floor, and one blanket. But they were capturing so many PO, so many airmen, shooting down so many planes, that it ended up that in the room I was in, there was five guys all sleeping in that one room and eating off of that one table. And it was, we were there a little over a week before they got to interrogate us. And the officer that interrogated me, I had the wrong dog tags, and my dog tag said New Haven, Connecticut. He says, oh, you're from New Haven. I says, yeah. He says, I know New Haven. He says, I went to Yale. <laughs> he knew more about New Haven than I did. He knew all the streets, College Street, Elm Street, Chapel, Church. He knew them all. And he, he just sat there shooting the bull. He never asked me anything about the military, which was all right with me. From there, we went to a camp run by the English, and they took our photos and stuff like that, and they give us a, a, a couple of pieces of clothing. And then we were put on a, a freight train, a boxcar. There was two boxcars. One was for the well GIs, and the other one was for the, the wounded and sick. And there were so many in the, in the one car, in the first car, but I says, the heck with this. And the first stop we made, I went back and got in the medical car, and I stayed there the rest of the time. One night, one of the fella, one of the lads in there, his knee was all infected from shot, flak, I guess. So they took four of us GIs and two German soldiers, and we carried him to a hospital. <clears throat> there was a nurse there taking care of him, and of course, he, he was hit high enough that you could see what everything he owned. And she kind of looked at us and started to laugh. He says, don't worry about it. We didn't care. We left there, and those two soldiers 
separated. One went one way with the two canteens and the yellow one stayed with us. A little while later he came back with two canteens full of beer. He gave us all a, a slug of beer. Then he took us in the restaurant and bought us a bowl of potato soup for all of us. And then we carried back the wounded man to the, to the freight train. So I thought that was pretty nice. Yeah. What year was that, Ed? 1943. I can't see who called that. Now I want to explain a little bit about... Uh, In fact, it was October 8th, which also happened to be my 22nd birthday. <laughs> the palliasses that he referred to, that was what we slept on. It was a sack stuffed with, with hay. Hay or, cel or, or excelsior. And it was, uh, that was it. Full of fleas. Full of fleas. And well, lice. In, in, in our case, it wasn't fleas. What it was was bed bugs. Well, yeah. lice and bed bugs. <laughs> the first night we were lying there on the pally ass, and I felt something on my stomach. <laughs> I, and uh, the lights are out, of course, but in the morning I looked, and there's a trail right across, right across the skin. So uh, I asked somebody, uh, what, what caused this? And they said, oh, don't worry about it. It's just the bed bugs, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, find, we tried everything to get rid of them. We thought they were living in the, in the pally ass, but they weren't. They were living in the cracks in the ceiling. Right. And what they were doing is they would get over the top of the, the bed at night, and they would drop down. <laughs> and we tried everything to get rid of them. We uh, we tried uh, we put the, we put stuff over we put the cans of water around trying to trap them. And uh, we got a hold of some of the terrible English cigarettes and blow wow. smoke in them. That didn't work. <laughs> Did they ever so fumigate I, your barracks? Pardon me. Didn't they ever fumigate your barracks? No. No. Never. What we finally did, when the weather got warm enough, I moved the bed outside and slept under the stars. <laughs> and that was, that finally got rid of them. But uh, I'll tell you one more bed bug story and that will be it. Uh, Liz, you won't like this. <laughs> we all had casts, so most of us had casts. The bed bugs were living inside the casts. When we got back to uh, Italy after uh, being repatriated uh, at the end of the war, we were taken to this hospital, and uh, the, uh, the doctors said, uh, uh, we told them, we said, we got bed bugs in our cast. They didn't believe it. So they, they took one out, and all the bed bugs from running out all over the floor. <laughs> you should have heard the, the chaos that went on there. The nurses were running around screaming. <laughs> they, I had just had issued to me some brand and right at the end of the war from the British Red Cross, I got a pair of uh, ammo bo boots. These are British ammo boots, a British uh, battle jacket, and I was, you know, I was going to bring it home, of course. They made us burn everything we had <laughs> in the hospital. So I ended up with nothing that I had before that time. Those bed bugs bite? Did they ever bite? Oh, I <laughs> how they bite. <laughs> Didn't your mother ever say, don't let the bed yeah, bugs yeah, bite? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never saw one before in my life until <laughs> until then. Question. Yeah. When you said the camp was run by the British, do you mean it was run by the British Red Cross or by... No, POW. POW is the RAF. Right. It was, a, it was a, a POW camp, but it was to accept the prisoners when they were first captured, to, to supply them with clothing and whatnot before they were taken to another prison camp. Yeah, the, uh, in my camp, we had the British also, and they were, they were in charge. That is... The prisoners did a lot of the uh, ordinary stuff in the uh, camp. Uh, the, the Germans uh, were in charge, but the uh, British carried out the everyday stuff. And uh, 
there's a man, what they call the man of confidence. Did you have a man of confidence? Well, we had a camp commander who was uh, uh, just a tech sergeant. The British call him the man of confidence. That's exactly what they call him. It sounds like a confidence man, right? (laughs) uh, That's uh, that's what they said. And he was was a a sergeant major in the uh, British 8th Army. And he was the only guy in prison camp that I know of. He used to salute everybody. He saluted me all the time with the, <laughs> the British salute. And uh, he, he looked like he was on the parade ground. He, I, how he did it in prison camp, I don't know. Well, incidentally, uh, this is not the way I dressed in prison camp. <laughs> uh, if you ever watched Hogan's Heroes with uh, Colonel Hogan, sometimes appears in class A uniform. I don't know how he got it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> we, we did have military uniforms. I had suntan pants and an OD jacket. They don't kind of go together very well. How old were you at this time? When I got shot down? 21. Yeah. No, pardon me, I was 20. It was 20. 18 when I went in the service. When did you get shot down? Pardon me? When did you get shot down? I got, I got shot down in the uh, December of 1944. You were 43? 40, October of 43. Incidentally, I was one of the men that made the first trip to Schweinfurt when we actually lost 60 airplanes that day. And our group was, like Russ said, was the highest loss of anybody. We lost 11 planes and 10 crews. One crew landed in the channel and was saved. You never saw anything like it in your life. There was planes going down all the time, blowing up and spiraling and looping and almost unbelievable. And that was my fourth mission. I wished it was my last. Oh, by the way, did, did you, uh, did, uh, you, you guys have your own reunion right every year. We have what? Your own reunions. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I've been to a couple of them. Yeah. I went to Salt Lake City, and I went to where, Tennessee? Mm-hmm. Went down to Tennessee. Yeah. Salt Lake City was great. That was the first time our I pulled all the, the members of our crew got together. So. I pulled the ver- I pulled. The B-24 is on B-24. Uh, we pulled a diversion for that mission. To Schweinfurt? Yeah. Yeah, there was a number of planes full of diversion. Yeah. Schweinfurt and Regensburg were yeah, both. Right. And right. then you right. guys went up towards the north. That's right, the North Sea, right. Fighters. That's right. They drew them right into us. <laughs> Every guy, you know, we didn't get credit for them, you know. Huh? We, the, B, the B-24 guys never got credit for them. Is know? that right? I did, I did, uh, 16 diversions, not got credit for one of them. I thought anybody that once they crossed the channel was a mission. No. The only way they, the only way you would get credit, we would, we would, they would load us up with ammunition, no bombs. We would go up to North Sea to draw the fighters up, to, up right. to us. So, that, and the only way we would get credit for a mission is if we got attacked by right. fighters. Mm-hmm. So you know, it wasn't but, right. But, but <laughs> that's know. right, but we went up there to do that, even right. though we didn't get attacked. That's why you went was to draw the fighters right. up there. Ed, how was your food? Wasn't it great? Oh, man, we ate like kings. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, we actually more or less lived on what we called our, or what we got as our Red Cross parcels. The German food was boiled potatoes, boiled root or baker, they called it soup and dehydrated cabbage soup full of all kinds of bugs and maggots and the only that ended up in the latrine we dumped it into the latrine the potatoes were all right the, the rutabakers weren't all that bad but we lived on our red cross parcels which we usually got once a week if they were in most of the time they were they contained a can of beef, a can of bully beef, a can of spam, uh, instant coffee, powdered milk, cubed sugar, tea bars, soap, 
cigarettes, four packs of cigarettes, margarine, <coughs> orange concentrate, <coughs> liver paste, K rations. There might have been other stuff, I just can't remember them all. But that's what we lived on for a week. We, with we a, a loaf of bread house. divided amongst four men. And that bread was looked at, it looked and tasted like it was made out of sawdust. It was made out of sawdust. <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> it was. I've been told by uh, people it was made out of sawdust. What? Were you able to fraternize with any civilians to buy or barter pieces? The only time we could do that was when they force marched us out of our camp, when the Russians were getting too close. We went on a 19 day force march. And two, four, five of us formed a combine. And one of the fellows spoke German. So we give him all our soap and all our cigarettes. And while we were on our forced march, he would go to the farmhouses or the stores. And for soap and cigarettes, he would get loaves of bread, chicken, eggs, whatever. That was the only time. Because we never saw any civilians. In the kit. Go ahead. Yeah, and did you ever use uh, the Red Cross parcels after you were done with all that stuff in there? Did you ever use that stuff in there for anything else? Yes, I did. Hand me that stuff there. Slide that over. <laughs> this is this is what we ate out of. We had a bigger one for soup. This was for coffee. These metal bindings are what came on the parcels to hold all the cartons together. So it was great. We also got all these bands and we took the plywood out of the bunks and we made like hammocks, uh, square, squares, you know, hammocks running both ways and it kind of concave. It was much more comfortable to sleep in. Then also, I don't know if any of you know what this might be. I brought it here three years ago when I gave my talk. Actually, it's a water heater, electric water heater. We had two wires coming from the ceiling down and back of the wall. We put a nail through the wall and made a hole, wrapped the wire around it, and put the, hooked the, the wire into the hole. Then we just used to plug these wires into those two holes put it in a pail of water and you've got the metal cover on the inside but it doesn't touch the outside don't as you do can this probably at see don't do this. <laughs> one, one wire goes to one and one goes to the other and the water made the circuit without blowing the fuse and we well, used to heat our water by a pail and I'll tell you their electric meters were going like that <laughs> So they finally, they finally decided we were using too much electricity. Every day after we came in and had breakfast, come in from roll call, had breakfast, they come around and they took the fuses out of the box so we wouldn't have electricity. I, I want to talk a little bit about that because in, in my room, we shared a room with six, six people were in our room, three Brits and three three Americans. One of the British was had been a uh, an electrician in civilian life. And he was ma he was making these by the gross. <laughs> he was he was he was selling them to the Germans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They would come in and say, Hey Boyley, you got one of those heaters? <laughs> so well, you know, I'm not supposed to have a heater. Well, you, you, have you got one? And so he would he would I'll sell it to him. And uh, where he was getting the parts, of course, he was getting getting the can. We were getting the cans from the Red Cross. But wiring, we were running out of wiring. So what he was doing, the the Germans were very short of of uh, skilled personnel. All the men were in their service. They didn't have a camp electrician. They knew he was an electrician, so they used to have come around to him and ask him to help them out. 
And he always helped them out. Every time he helped them out, he, he ripped 20 feet of uh, wire out of the wall <laughs> and brought it back. And that's where, that was his supply. And he overloaded the remaining circuits. So I said, I hope the war ends before the place burns down. <laughs> well, we, I got, we got most of our wire from the barracks next door. The first was that every barracks was divided into two parts, A and B. Section A of barracks 32 was the Red Cross clothing barracks. And the B section was the Germans' supply room. They kept their coal, their tools, and all that stuff in there. And unbeknown to them, I made a key that opened their padlock, an open their door, not a padlock, but a regular lock. We used to go in there and steal a box of coal every night in the wintertime. And I went in there and pulled the wires all out so we would have wire for this. I also got some good wire and I, I made myself a, a crystal radio set and I picked up a, an earphone from one of the other PWs from another nationality that used to come in and work in the camp. Because we were all sergeants or anywhere from a sergeant to a master sergeant, and the Germans cannot make you work. According to the Geneva Convention, you could not work if you were above the rank of sergeant. So we couldn't go out and work on farms. We had to get by with what we could get in the camp. So that's, that's about how that worked. Yeah. What were your uh, plans, if any, to evade capture when you bailed out? Well, to be honest with you, I didn't actually have any, and it happened so fast that I didn't get a chance to get any. You didn't have any uh, pre-planned... Uh, well, they told you to try to escape, to hide. Uh, try to, did, you, uh, did, you, did you wear a sidearm, by the way? They, we had them. They gave, us our, they gave us the permission to wear them if we wanted to. I personally didn't want them. I mean, you're facing a whole bunch of soldiers. What good is a sidearm to you? You're just looking to get shot. False sense of security. Have, right. So have, I did not care. How about an escape kit? With, uh, we had no escape kit. With food and Well, we had no things. food of any kind. We did have maps, and that's about yeah. all. Yeah. So you knew where you were, and you knew where you were. Well, you I, know that, I know where the target was, where yeah. we got hit. But I, where I landed, I have no idea. If it is dead, I don't know. You, what happened to the rest of your crew, did you say? Well, the ball turret gunner and one waist gunner got killed. The right waist gunner, well, I was supposed to, I was top turret, I was supposed to bail out through the bomb bay. I pulled the emergency release for the bomb bay doors two or three times, it wouldn't open. My co-pilot was there waiting to go out with me. And I couldn't open it, so I said, the hell with this, and I went back through the bomb bay in the radio room. I got back in the waist, and the left waist, no, the right waist gunner was sitting on the planks where they stood to fire their guns. He had got shot between the legs with a 20 millimeter. And of course, being in the waist compartment, we had our harnesses on, but he didn't have his two straps hooked here because he couldn't stand up, because you got to have him tight. Yep. So when I come through, he asked me to help him with the straps. So I did buckle up the straps, I got him up, and I threw him out the door. The other waste gunner, assistant engineer, he had pulled a ripcord in the plane. His parachute, all the silk was all over the airplane, but all his shroud lines were still intact. So I bundled the parachute up into his arms and tried to get him out. And about that time, another rocket hit the plane. This happened to be the first time in all our missions that they actually shot rockets at us. They had twin-engine fighter bombers lined up 10 to 12 of them in back of us in a row. And we're shooting every plane that got damaged from the flak, fell out of formation. They would line up on you and shoot these rockets at you. They took the about eight foot of the right wing off. They hit number one engine. The pilot couldn't feather it. And it was windmilling so bad it vibrated and fell off. Number two engine he was able to feather. 
They knock some of the horizontal stabilizer and some of the vertical stabilizer. The big hole in the radio room. Another direct hit. Hit down right near the bomb bay. And that's when we believe the ball turret got, the ball turret gunner got killed right then and there. So the waste gunner that had the parachute, he wouldn't go out. And I tried to get him to go out and throw him out. And he fell against the other side of the plane. So I says, the hell with this, and I jumped out myself. And as far as I know, I know, I know he is buried over in, in France, because I got it in, in one of my books. But the ball turret gunner, I have no idea what happened to him or where he is. The waste gunner that got so badly wounded spent a, a year in a German hospital. They treated him very good. And luckily, I met him and all the rest of the, of the crew, all the officers. We all met in Camp Lucky Strike in France after we got liberated, which was great. So they weren't in the same POW camp? The officers, they were the privileged. <laughs> <laughs> they were not. The only, they were all sergeants. There was 4,300 sergeants in our camp alone. Just, that's just Americans. But the camp had a hundred and something thousand PWs from what Russian Serbs. Excuse me, right? I just went, what, what camp was that? 17? I was in Stalag 17B. The famous 17. That That's the one the movie was made out made of. And I've got a book here. I've got a book here of actual pictures taken in the camp, put out by the same guy that wrote that that movie. There were over a hundred thousand POWs in that camp. No, all together, counting the Serbs, the Russians, the Poles, the the Italians, very many, many Italians. They used to use them for doing all the work in our camp. Now I gotta just throw this in here about the privilege. <laughs> oh come on, you guys had it made. <laughs> we didn't have a separate camp. We, 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 my, I had uh, roommates who were enlisted men. I didn't have, I didn't have a special officers camp. There were only six officers in the whole camp. We already uh, had one, and he was a chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would have heard your prayers for you. <laughs> yeah, they finally put up a church the last well, few months. As far as, Russ always likes to kid about the, uh, about the easy life we had in, in Southern... <laughs> yeah, it was easy. <laughs> yeah, a nice easy life. Slay around, play poker, and <laughs> pinochle, and set back, and bridge, and you know, Stalag whatever. Three. Stalag 3 was the uh, officers. Stalag 1 was the interrogating for the officers, and Stalag 3 were for you guys, officers. Well, they, they didn't work out I, that my, way. Uh, my they, navigator... What they, what they did is, is, towards the end of the war... They, they sent people everywhere. Originally, they had a camp for just officers, off log, they called it, which is short for officers uh, lager. But uh, towards the end of the war... Oh, near the things, end, they were a chaos then. Things were, things were more uh, mixed up. And uh, there were only 35 Americans in my prison camp. The rest were Brits, Russians. We had Russians... By the thousands, I have no idea how many well, we Russians did too, there were. They weren't we not, in our. Compound. They were in a separate compound. Right. In fact, uh, the Germans didn't care if we mixed with them. No, we couldn't. The we Russians couldn't. didn't want. The Russian commissars didn't want us to mix with them. They prohibited their men from uh, mixing with us, because I made friends with a Russian officer on the train going into prison camp. He could speak a little uh, German, and I could speak a little German, and we, we conversed in German. Uh, and uh, we, we became friendly, but uh, once we got to prison camp, he, he came over and told me, he says, uh, his colonel wouldn't let him come over anymore. He didn't want to have anything to do with the Americans. I guess they're afraid we'll convert them or something. Yeah. Yeah. All right, but you said initially when you first started, both of you guys said better to be caught by the military if you had to bail out. Absolutely. I had a buddy that was uh, on a B-24, his flight engineer, he got shot down. He ended up, this is in the summertime now, he got shot down, he ended up in a tree. And there were people out paying 
Germans out hay in the field. They came over with pitchforks. Yeah. Uh -huh. for right. And a military vehicle came speeding up. And he says, boy, Al, I was lucky. And it says, they were coming at me with those pitchforks. Yeah. But that day. And the worst uh, people of all uh, were the women. Oh, and how? They treated the people awful if they could get a hold. Here's you gotta, you gotta remember, you right. just bombed the city, you know. Yeah. And the people are around after you. Question the down there. The, uh, I know that you love off. They took good care of you guys if, right. they, if they got a hold of you. Down here, go ahead. Were your camps run by the regular German army or by the SS? Right. German army mostly. Right. Very few. We didn't see too many SS men. They used to come into camp once in a while. In fact, they caught me when I was when I, whenever I put the fuse in in the morning, if any Germans come into the camp, into the barracks, they usually come in the front door, and the, the word went out, you know. So I'd run around from the outside, <laughs> grab the fuse, and pull it out. So this particular day, they hollered Germans in the barracks. So I went around to the front to pull out the fuses. And it happened to be three German officers. They just went in, took a look, and come out, and they caught me taking the fuse yeah. out. <laughs> well, they took my POW number, and it was probably a month, month and a half, when they come looking for me. And the soldier come into the barracks, he says, I'm looking for Sergeant Lapointe. And I went like that to the barracks chief. But the barracks chief says, he's not here. Where is he? He's outside in the compound, walking. What's he wearing? Suntan pants and sometimes shirt. We all wore the same thing. <laughs> and that stupid German, believe me, they were, the soldiers were stupid. He's out there in the compound looking for me. Of course, he never found me. A couple of weeks later, they come back again. Done the same thing, I wasn't there. Finally, I got sick of it. The next time he came, I told him. I told the barrack chief, let him, let him take me. So they took me down to the, the shack where the, where the sergeant or the lieutenant or whatever he was was there, and some of the guards. And he said, oh, he says, have a seat. He says, we're looking for another guy. And he was doing the same thing. So I sat there for a half an hour and finally I says, look, I got better things to do than sit here and, and do nothing. So I says, when you want me, come back to my barracks and get me. When they come back to the barracks, I wasn't there again. <laughs> I used to drive them guys crazy. So finally I did go, they took me up to the, to the headquarters. And this officer interrogated me. He throws this wire at me. He says, this wire was yours. Oh, he, first of all, he shows me the fuse. I said, that's a fuse? I said, we've got fuses in America, but they don't look like that. Then he throws the wire at me. Here's the wire you made it out of. I says, I'm sorry. I says, I never made them. I don't know nothing about it. So he sits down. He types a letter out. And he gives it to me. He says, sign this. He says, I can't sign that. I says, I can't even read it. It's in German. I don't understand it. He says, well, I'll interpret it for you. So he read what's supposed to be in the letter. When he got all through, I says, I'm sorry. I don't know that that's what that letter says, that I'm not going to sign it. So I never did sign it. If I'd have got, if I got, actually got caught or reprimanded, I would have spent probably three or four weeks in the boob, which was just a single room, bread and water, and nothing else. And I says, no way did I want that. But luckily, they put us on our forced march, because the Russians were getting close. And they forced marches for 19 days, so I missed going to the boob. Yeah. Where were you two fellows specifically when you, when you got shot down? What was the question? Where were you when you shot when you were shot down? You know, what part of the uh, Austria, Germany, where? Uh, I was flying towards uh, Innsbruck, oh. and we were at uh, uh, right near uh, Rossignoli. 
which is in northern Italy, right near the uh, Austria, Austria, uh, German, Austria. German uh, Italy, Italy border, Italian border. Austria or Italy? It was well. I thought we were all over the border, but actually we're in we were in Italy. And the reason I was confused about that is because I didn't know my history at that time. The area it was the Tyrol, and the people there are all German speaking. It's Italy, but the people are all German speaking, if you can. And it still is to this day. That, that part of uh, northern Italy uh, was contested back and forth between uh, Austria and Italy over the years, and the people are still. Uh, You'd swear you were in Germany. Uh, all uh, German speaking. Uh, their customs are German, and uh, <laughs> yet they're, they're Italian. I believe that's where they found the uh, remains of the bronze man. Could be. There's a yeah. someone that went back five thousand years yeah. and buried in glacier. Right. That area there, right? right. At was, the uh, at the end, uh, I was shut down in over Bremen, Germany. Now, how far we had gone before we had to bail out, I don't know. But we got hit by flak right over the target. Of course, once you get, once you get, when, when you see the flak stop, I mean, you see just a black cloud of flak. Once the flak stops, you said, "Well, now trouble's starting," because that's when the fighters came in. And then when the fighters left, the flak come back again. But uh, that's that's what hit us originally was the flak. What date? What, what date was that? Uh, what date was that? October eighth, forty three. You'll never forget it. <laughs> My birthday. How can I? Up here, I have I have a picture. I have a picture of uh, the area where I was shot down. When you at the end, if you want to yeah, take a look, sure. there's also a, a map here which shows where we were on course mm. to. Uh, I have a complete book here with pictures actually taken in the camp. Yeah. And our, on our first march, this gentleman was first. John. Did either of you uh, experience escape attempts in your camp? And if so, what happened? Were well, they successful or were they caught? Two guys is all I know of that tried to escape from our camp. One of them was from my barracks. And they waited till a winter night when there was snow. And they figured they could put sheets on, they wouldn't see them. Well, evidently, somebody had tipped the Germans off, and they were waiting for them. And while they were climbing the fence, they shot them both and killed them. Bullets were flying all around the camp. They were coming from compounds across the street, which had no, couldn't possibly see the guys, but they were shooting. The barracks right next door to me, one of the guys got shot in the back end, right in his rump, laying in his bunk. The bullets were flying all over the place. 